at the end of the story of Adam and Eve, there's like a fall into history. Right? So in one way, history begins with the fall. But there's like a second fall, I think, with the flood in the Tower of Babel. And history, in an even more real sense, begins now. It begins with the story of Abraham. And, and it's, it's, we're no longer precisely in the realm of the purely mythical. That would be another way of thinking about it. We have an identifiable person who's part of an identifiable tribe, who's doing identifiable things. We're in the realm of history. And so history begins twice in the Old Testament. I suppose it begins again after Moses as well. But we've moved out of the domain of the purely mythical into the realm of history with, with the emergence of the stories about Abraham. This is from Aldous Huxley. So the first thing that, that I want to talk about in relationship to the Abrahamic stories is this idea of the experience of God. Because Abraham, although quite identifiable as an actual individual, is also characterized by this peculiarity. And the peculiarity is that God manifests himself to Abraham. Both as a voice, and, but also as a presence. The, the stories never describe exactly how God manifests himself, except now and then he comes in the form of an angel. That's fairly concrete. But it's a funny thing that the author of, or authors of the Abrahamic stories, seems to take the idea that God would make an appearance more or less for granted. And so, it's very, I think the part of the reason that I've struggled so much with the Abrahamic stories is because it's so hard to get a handle on that and to understand what that might mean. And so I'm going to hit it from a bunch of different perspectives and we'll see if we can come up with some understanding of it. The first thing I'll do is tell you a story about a female neurologist whose name escapes me at the moment. She wrote a book called My Stroke of Insight. Jill Bolte, I think is her name. And she was a Harvard trained. She, was, she, had, she had medical training from Harvard in neuropsychological function and knew a lot about hemispheric specialization. We talked a little bit about hemispheric specialization before. One of the ways of conceptualizing the difference between the two hemispheres is that the left hemisphere operates in known territory and the right hemisphere operates in unknown territory. That's one way of thinking about it. The left hemisphere operates in the orderly domain and the right hemisphere operates in the chaotic domain. Or the left hemisphere operates in the domain of detail and the right hemisphere operates in the domain of the large picture. It's something like that. Now, people differ in their neurological wiring, so those are overgeneralizations, but that's okay. We're, we'll live with that for the time being. It's certainly not an overgeneralization to point out that you do, in fact, have two hemispheres and that their structures differ. And if the connections between them are cut, which could happen, for example, if you had surgery for intractable epilepsy, that each hemisphere would be capable of housing its own consciousness. That's been well documented by a neuro, neuro, neurologist named Gazaniga, who did, and Sperry, who did split brain experiments, must be 30 years ago now. So, and we know that the right and the left hemisphere are specialized for different functions. The right hemisphere, for example, seems to be more involved in the generation of negative emotion, and the left hemisphere more involved in the generation of positive emotion and approach. So the right hemisphere stops you, and the left hemisphere moves you forward. Anyways, Jill Bolte, I hope I've got that right had a stroke and maintained consciousness during the stroke and analyzed it while it was happening. And she was able, while it was happening, to hypothesize about what part of her brain was being destroyed. And what, so she had a congenital blood vessel malformation and had an aneurysm. And it just about killed her. But she said that it affected her left hemisphere. And she said that she experienced a sense of divine unity as a consequence of the stroke. Because the left hemisphere function was disrupted and destroyed. And so she became right hemisphere dominant. And her experience of that was the dissolution of the specific ego into, the, into absolute consciousness, something like that. Now, that's only a case study, and you don't want to make too much of case studies. But there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that those two kinds of consciousness exist. One being your consciousness of you as a localized and specified being. And the other being 
this capacity to experience oceanic dissolution and the sense of the cosmos being one. Now, why we have those capacities for different conscious experiences is very difficult to understand. I mean, part of me thinks that maybe we have a generic human brain that's the brain of the species. And allied with that, we have a specific individual brain. And one is the left hemisphere and the other is the right hemisphere. The left hemisphere being the specific individual brain. And usually it's on and working because you obviously have to take care of yourself as a specific entity and not as a generalized cosmic phenomena. It's hard to dice salary when you're a generalized cosmic phenomena. <laughs> Right? So you have to be more pointed than that. But, but look, let, let's make no mistake about it. The fact that those different states of consciousness exist is not disputable. They can be elicited in all sorts of ways. And so, 